Huh? It's good for you. It's good for me. <laughs> to an degree. So Charlene's passing around. Um, if you want to take notes, um, I'm trying to get you guys in that habit. If you're not in that habit yet, some of you picked it up before I seen. But um, the name of the sermon today, the name of the message today is God is bigger than my blindness. God is bigger than my blindness. So um, this past week, I was reading an article, and I, I honestly I didn't know what to say about this article. Because what this article said was that the state of California, I don't know whether it was Senate representatives, I don't remember, they didn't pass a law or a bill yet, but they passed a motion, uh, a written motion that said that churches have to agree with what the state says and, and preach in their pulpits what's said by the state of California. It's not, it's not a law yet, but it will be something that they try to put into law and it's probably something that will be put in front of the, um, our Supreme Court pretty quickly because what it does is it says that if you speak out against sin, namely the LBB, well, LG, whatever those letters are, abortion and things like that, um, then there can be actions taken against you or fines. And it's coming. It's coming. And today's sermon's good for that, right? It's, it's, there's... The world's going to take over. I mean, it's coming. We understand that. Jesus said it would happen. But um, the, the country of Canada already has this in place. I don't know if you know this or not. It's completely in place across. Their, their president, um, Trudeau, is completely, completely as far liberal as you can get. To the point where he walked naked in the streets with, with a group that was because he wanted to show solidarity with groups that were naked. They like to run around with no clothes on. Wow. So, that's the way, and you can be arrested if you preach against sin in Canada. And that, it's not just the gay rights and the abortion and stuff like that. It's a lot of other stuff that goes with that. There's, it's, it's all inclusion. There's no, you can't tell somebody there's wrong. But this law in California, what struck me the most was that it specifically said that Christians, Christians, cannot try to persuade somebody that the reason they're, they are the way they are is because it's a sin. It specifically said that. It's not a law. It's just a written bill. So, again, just wanted to make you aware of that. I just saw it. It just came about in the last couple of weeks. So maybe you're kind of wondering why am I talking about, you know, what am I thinking? Why am I saying blindness? I think that kind of helps a little bit. But why did I use the term blindness? Because the Bible specifically speaks about two things, right? And, and it uses two different ways of doing that. It says that we're either spiritually blind or we're spiritually dead. We understand that? We're dead in our trespasses and sin. I'm not going to talk about today. I've talked about that before. But it, it does the other way, and it says it talks about being spiritually blind. And, and if you're a Christian in here today, I want you to understand that the reason I'm talking about this is because I want you to understand that you've got family out there, friends, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, that are spiritually blind, and maybe the approach we're having with them is a little, means change a little bit. So to, to understand this is I want you to understand what spiritually blind means. And, and, you know, what we've been talking about is Paul. We've been kind of walking through the life of Paul and, and how he was blind, and, and we'll talk about that because... I, I don't understand why was he acting the way he was acting? Why was he doing the things he was doing? Why was he talking about the things he was doing? Why was his actions? Because the Bible is going to tell you that he was blind. And Paul himself will be the one that explains that. Um, and, and just to get a sense of that, okay, I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit weird today, okay? So get in a comfortable position. I'm going to, it's a strange request, okay? Now I want you to take your hands and cover your, if you're able to, and cover your eyes completely to where you can't see anything. This, if you can do that, cover them up. I see some of you are a little bit reluctant, maybe, but it's okay. Cover your eyes if you can. And, and I'm going to take this super soaker here. <laughs> Nobody, I, I didn't get anybody. Ed, you're cheating. Anyone. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. I know it's a strange request. I want you to cover your eyes. See, this is the real situation. Imagine that not that you can't see, not that you don't want to see, but you, 
you just there's no way for you to see it all, correct? Imagine that. No way to see it all. Okay, you can take your hands off there now. Thank you. So let me ask you something. Would you ever slap a cripple guy? Would you ever tell him, hey, get up! Would you ever do that? That's really some kind of 1950s and sensitive language, right? I mean, it's something we don't talk about anymore. We use better language than that now. We use better language, right? So we use the word physically disabled, right? So you see the change from things, from, from the evolution of things, right? And, and, and we use a sensitive language, right? See, that's how the Bible describes a spiritually blind person. It describes it as we call a person who, is, who, who can't walk, we call them physically disabled, right? We call a person who is mentally has problems, we call them mentally dis disabled. Am I using the correct terms? I believe so. I tried to look it up and make sure I was right. So Paul at this point in his life, his condition is that he's mentally disabled. And, and, and Paul at this point in his life, is, it, I'm sorry, he's not mentally disabled. He's, he's spiritually disabled. And that's what the Bible uses. I mean, it's, it's not that he can't, it's not that he won't, it's not that he, he doesn't, it's just that he can't see. You get that, right? He just can't see. Turn to your neighbor and say, he just can't see. So I'm trying to get you involved in here. So write that down. He just can't see. See, you can't see because I want to give you some spiritual background of this. I want to tell you what the Bible says about it. And don't take my word for it. Let's go there. So what I'm going to do is we're going to go to John 6.44. If you haven't memorized this verse, it's another good one to remember. This should be number three. Right? Um, it's a good one. John 6.44. And it says this. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. They're not getting saved. They're not getting saved unless the Father draws them. They're not getting saved. Unless the Father gives them faith, they're not getting saved. She's not going to get saved. And he's not going to get saved. They're not going to. Because all of us in this room, at one point or other, were born on this broad road. Do you remember that broad road? And God said, nope, jump off that road and get on this little narrow road with me. Narrow is that path. It's a very busy highway. It's like eight lanes wide. Right? There's a... There's a um, a highway in China that's like 60 lanes wide and it goes down to four. And that's kind of how I describe it. And it's packed all the time. Bumper to bumper and it's squeezing and squeezing and squeezing and squeezing until they get to four. And, and, you know, all these people, they're running headlong into an eternity separated from God. We get that. But unless God himself interrupts, and I, I've used scripture after scripture after scripture to show you this, Unless God interrupts, unless he intercepts, unless he stops, unless he turns that spiritually disabled person around, they're always going to be a spiritually disabled person. God has to do it. God has to interrupt. God has to intercept. And it's called spiritual blindness. God calls it being, you can write that down, spiritual blindness. God has to intercept that. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14 says this, the natural person, which would be somebody that's not saved, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. Now, how many of you went into somebody and they just kind of laughed and chuckled? You've been there, right? That's folly to them. And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. So you, as a spiritual person who have been, had your eyes opened by God, are only be judged by God. For who has understood the mind of the Lord as to instruct him? That's self-explanatory, right? But we have the mind of Christ. So Paul, he described a person in this condition. So Paul's explaining himself, right? They're in this eight-lane highway. And he called all these people on this highway a natural man. And the way that we were, and that's just the way we were before, before God interrupted in your life, if you're a Christian here today, before he interrupted, you were a natural man or woman. That's, and he said that the natural man does not perceive the things of the Spirit of God. They don't understand it. Because if you think about what I said before, you are dead and your trespasses and sin. No way around it. 
God has to interrupt. The Holy Spirit has to interrupt. He interrupts. And in fact, you can't do anything. You have no discernment for spirituality. None. Unless the Holy Spirit... It's just foolishness. The Bible's foolishness. And you can see that in the world. They hate the Bible. And, and right now at this point in time, Paul, who's a, he's the Christian murderer, right? He's Saul, right? He's the Christian murderer, and he's called Saul, and he's certain that what he's doing is right. He's confident. He's 100% confident that he's going around murdering Christians and, and putting them in jail and cuffing them, and he's confident. And the idea of Jesus and following Jesus is just foolishness to him. Can you see that in the Scripture? You'll see it in a minute. And now, it, it, now, is it clear, right? It, it, it's clear then in, in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, and, and we'll read that in just a second, but it describes the spiritually disabled person, and maybe you are that person today. I don't know. And, and many of you have found Christ. I, I truly believe that some of us have found Christ, and you are this person, but let's read this Scripture. It says in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it says this. I'm, start, I'm going to go back to verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, even if it's covered, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Right? The natural man. That the God of this age, who's the God of this age? Satan. Satan is the God of this age. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So God has allowed, Satan can do nothing at all without God allowing him to, has allowed Satan to blind people. Now, how should we think about them if, we can't, if they can't see? If, if the people that we know that are Christian, they can't see. They, they can't see that God of this age has blinded their minds. They can't see that Satan's doing that. They can't see that, and they can't believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of God, the Son of God, shines into them and takes them out of that darkness. Satan doesn't want people to see. He wants to deceive them. He, wants, he doesn't want you to see. He's trying to drag as many people down to hell as he, as, as he can. He wants, to, he wants everybody on this broad road, and not that narrow road. He wants everybody on this broad road, because they're spiritually disabled, and they can't see. They're blind. And, and now, you know, we've been studying this life of Paul, and, and he's been murdering people, and he's been dragging them off, and he's been putting them in prison, and he's been threatening them, and so on, and so on, and so on. And, and part of me is like, come on, Paul, haven't you walked into some of these places and just seen them serving Jesus and seen the love on the people's faces? Haven't you seen that? Come on, Paul. Really? But he's spiritually blind. He's spiritually blind. Now think about the people that we know, right? The people we know. He, they can't see. And I think this is going to help you here. Now I want you to do, what I want you to do is just take a second. And this is going to be, this is what I want you to do. I want you to jot down a couple of names of people that you know that are spiritually blind. That you know they're blind. Just jot a couple names down. And if you, they're spiritually blind from God. He's spiritually blind. She's spiritually blind. And I think this is going to help you the rest of the message. It's going to, because you, I'm going to invite you to just, just take that moment and do it. And, and maybe you want to, I want you to think about this. Maybe you've been angry at that person. Maybe you've been just, because they're blind, right? You've been angry at them. Maybe, maybe you've been frustrated with that person. Or, you know, you, know, you don't need anger. They need compassion, right? They're blind. They, they don't need our frustration, right? They, they, they need our patience. They, they, they don't need... <laughs> they don't need whatever. So jot down a couple of names, and, and, and throughout the rest of this message, we're going to bring them up back and forth. I want you to look at them. I want you to look at the names. I want you to see the names of the people. And, and I want for you to start this, to continue to put that in your mind and continue for God to take this time in this service. He's going to communicate to you those names and what you can do and how you can affect their lives. I, I believe that God will do that. And, and, and maybe you're sitting here and you don't, you know, you should be able to come up with one name, I think. And I pray that God would use this time, if that's you, the blindness to open your eyes. So in in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, says this, In case 
In their case, the God of this world has blinded their minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God. But listen to this, verse 5. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. Do you proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord? And it says, with ourselves as your servants, for Christ, for Jesus' sake, so as we are servants to God, we are slaves to God, that's the, that's the way it's translated. And in verse 6 it says, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So God has to do it. You have no part, you are just his messenger. You have no part in salvation. God has to do it. Only God can. And if you're still, you're thinking, man, I, I don't know, but my, my sister's never going to come. My, my brother's never going to come. My mom's never going to come. My dad's never going to come. My spouse is never going to come. That's why we're here, man. Because we serve a big God. A big, big God. That's why we're here. God is about to intercept you know, in this scripture, we're going to read one of the greatest outlaws that the Bible ever put out there. He's murdering and killing people that are preaching, proclaiming Paul. He, it's Paul who's proclaiming that. But, but before his conversion, you need to understand his condition. He was blind. And so are the people that you see that you talk to. I mean, we've encountered at the end of chapter 7, remember Stephen, he just preached this message. It was, it was one of the best messages preached in the Bible, besides what Jesus did. And, and blind Saul was standing there as they stoned him for preaching. Right? He's standing there, and the, and the mob dragged Stephen out, and they, and, 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 and they, they, they threw, down, threw him down into this pit. Right? And, and Saul's like, oh, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. Give me your coat. Give me your coat. I want you to throw that rock harder and faster. Give me your coat. And he's cheering him on. Yes, let's go. Yeah. High five. Nice shot. You hit him right in the head. There's Stephen laying in the pit. Crushed skull, bleeding everywhere, dead. A little messier, right? And he's like, awesome. Let's do it again. Let's go find another one. That's the way Paul worked. The Bible does I'm, I'm, I think that's the way it went. After town, after town, after town. Dragging people into the streets. And it says later on, he didn't care if they were men or women, old or young. He didn't care. In, in, verse, in Acts 8, 1, it says this, and Paul approved of his execution. It's like, awesome, man, I love it. Here's your coat back. Nice throw. Good job. Right here, down low. You did great. Check. So Paul, Saul, sorry, you know, he, and it says this in, in, in chapter 8. It says, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of, G of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentations over him. So the people were crushed, man, that this guy, Stephen, he was chosen by the apostles, he's preaching, and, and Paul brought him down, right? He crushed by a great man of God. He was, he, for his loyalty to Jesus, he was crushed. I'm telling you, it's coming for us. That, that, that loyalty to Jesus thing, you're going to have to pick a side. You're not going to be able to hide it much longer. In verse 3 it says, But Saul was ravaging the church and entering the house after house. He dragged men off and women and committed them to prison. So we go to, you, have, you know, there's a little bit of an interruption in Acts and you have to go to chapter 9 to, get, to pick it back up. And it says, But Saul still breathing threats and murdering against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues at, at Damascus. So she could give me some letters and stuff so I can go get some more guys. I want to do this. I, you got to get rid of this. I mean, I am a godly man. I am marching on this legalistic path. I am doing this thing step by step. I'm not sinning. I'm doing what God has asked me to do. And I, I'm just going to go get them, man. I'm going to go get them. So he found if there's any along the way men or women, that he might bring them to Jerusalem. You know, it's funny because John 14, 6, it reminds me of what Jesus said. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus said, Jesus is the one way to God, right? I'm the one way to God. And no one comes to the Father except by me, Jesus. And he says, the message of, that's, that's the, our message that we take out. 
to Christianity. It's what Jesus is the way. Everybody say, Jesus is the way. So much of that has been recognized that Jesus is the only way, and that's what causes the problems in society today. You get that, right? That's what this California bill is all about. Because Jesus is the only way, and that's what we preach. And his laws and his rules and everything, that's what it's about. So, you know, it, along the way, he, if he found anyone that belonged to the way, right? That's what Christians were first called, was the way. I think we should change our apex, the way, right? The way. He would lock them up, march them back to Jerusalem. Interesting, like, you know, here's Paul. He's on his way, right? And I love this because he's about to meet the way, right? And, 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 and isn't that the only way? Is to meet the way? And, and, you know, here was I. I was doing my way. I was marching my way, and I got intercepted by the way. How about you? And now I'm doing his way, you know? So jot this down. This is my first point. No one is too lost. No one is too lost. No one is too lost for God to find them. I mean, if there ever was a kid... Paul was not his guy. Paul should not have been his guy. I mean, God wants to, everybody, God, he wanted everybody to go down this broad road, and every time God put a brick in the wall for Christianity, Paul pulled it out, or tried to at least, right? At least he thought. I mean, he, God sees him in his blindness, murdering, just everything you can think of he was doing to Christian people because he thought he was doing it for the love of God. He was murdering and, you know, and then he's blind, right? And God loves him, and God loves him in his blindness. And God says, I choose you. I choose you. No one under any circumstance, no one is, is too lost for God. I mean, look down at your list again. Look at your list. Look at your list. Look at down at those names that you wrote down. They're not too lost for God. Some of those people, it, you know, he's never getting saved. He's never going to come back to church. He's, he's, you know, she's not even near Jesus at all. Look at your list. They're not too far away. They're not too lost for God. I've been telling you the Bible is very clear because you are chosen by God, for God, for the glory of God. And hang on to this, this story because in the scriptures we can get our arms around this reality. You've got to get our arms around the reality that God is the one that's in charge and we serve a big God. No one anywhere under any circumstance is too lost for God. And it says, now as he went on his way, and we're in Acts, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven showed around him. And I like that word, Suddenly. Suddenly. I mean, because that's how it really happens, right? When somebody gets saved, when you got saved, did not happen suddenly? Did you expect it? Did you expect it? I didn't see this coming. You know, listen to the testimonies on Facebook. Listen to the testimonies in this church. People that would testify to this and watch the stories of people. I was blind and I didn't see it coming. I was dead in my trespasses and sin. I didn't see it coming. I had no idea what God had in store for me at all. But praise Jesus, he redeemed me. I never dreamt that I would be where I'd be today. I'm here and, and, I'm, and I'm serving Christ. How many of our stories are that way? What's your story? Remember we talked about last week, that's all you got to do is tell somebody your story. You don't have to tell them all these Bible verses and quote the Bible to them. Tell them how much Jesus loves you. Tell them what he means and Jesus will do the work. I just love that suddenly it came upon us. Suddenly, and that's, that's always the way it is, I think. I mean, that's always what I see. The person just seems so far. The child is the prodigal son who's just living so far away. And the spouse is down on their addiction or, or the, the spouse is down on whatever and they're so far away and they're never coming back. But God saves. He saves. 
the sister or parent or friend who's hostile to the gospel, the one that speaks against the gospel, God saves. No one's too lost for them to find. And notice here, suddenly a light from heaven showed around him and falling, falling to the ground. Another one, right? He fell to the ground. We got to get low. We got to get low. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Listen to the tenderness that he says. Listen to what he says. I mean, you know, Jesus Christ is confronting enemy number one to him right now. His enemy number one. But listen to the tenderness. He's the greatest destroyer of what Christ is building. I mean, every time that Christ builds something up, he tries to tear it down. Jesus didn't act like that towards blind people. He, he, he's not hard at all. I mean, we're angry at non-believers a lot of times, and we get, we get messed up in their world sometimes, but th that's not the heart of God. That's not the heart of God. And for us, or for them, and God loves his chosen people, that's why Jesus came. That's why he died. And God's not willing for anyone who would perish, to, that they would perish, but we know that some do, right? We want them to come to Repentance. Enemy number one, posters everywhere. Jerusalem, stay away from this guy. He's the man that's after us. He's going to kill us. And I, and I love the relentless tenderness of Jesus. And he says, notice what he says. He says, Saul, why are you persecuting? What's the next word? Why are you persecuting? Lift it up. I can't hear you. Me. Me. He didn't say, why are you persecuting John? Why did you kill Stephen? He said, why are you persecuting me? Who's that represent? That represents the Christian. I mean, look at your Bible. It says, why are you persecuting me? And note this, right? I know some of you are living this, and I, and I know you're, you're being persecuted, and I, and I love you when I say this, and I love you. Note that someone, they're persecuting you, maybe for your faith in Jesus Christ. Notice that Jesus takes that very, very personally. Very personally, he takes it. You are persecuting me, is what Jesus said. So they're persecuting Christians. They're the Christians that are dying, going to jail. Things are happening. They're persecuting them. And Jesus said, you're persecuting me. It's personal. It's personal to him. He takes it very personal. It's personal when we are opposed, right? When we are opposed, Jesus takes it personal and considers it as they're doing it to him is what it amounts to. It, it considers that you are persecuting Jesus himself again, again, and again, and again. Every abuse, right? Every persecution. And sometimes that's the reverse, right? For us. I mean, step out of the message, isn't it true that Jesus said in Matthew 25, every time you give a cup of cold water to somebody, every time you visit somebody in prison, you know, I mean, every time that you do something for the least of this person, the least of these brothers, you were doing it for who? For him, me. So every harsh act of persecution towards a Christian, Christ takes that very personally, and every act of kindness that we do, every act of forgiveness, every act of grace and forbearance from us, he takes that very personally too. He's like, you're loving me the same way you love me, you're loving me when you love someone else. It isn't that the way that parents love our kids, right? Do we not? I mean, it, it, you're loving me, and it's so great to be in God's family, is what he's trying to tell you, because he's going to protect you. He's got your back. You may suffer. You may have pain, but you're going to look back through that and see it. I mean, here's, here's Jesus. He moves towards Saul, and, and, but not too far, right? He didn't move too far because and, and you're not too lost for God to find you. You're not too lost. Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? So imagine the shock value at this point, right? He thinks he's doing everything good for God. Everything's good for God. Everything's good for God. And, and he's, he's taking Jesus out of the picture because Jesus is, wasn't the Messiah to him. Right? And he's imagining the shock value when Jesus shows up. Jesus is dead. 
It's very clear that he was facing God, right? Because he said, "Why are, he says, who are you, Lord? Which is not a common answer, right? I mean, you're not going to answer somebody. And he says, and then Jesus says, I'm Jesus. And Jesus is always the answer. He's always the answer. Remember how religious Paul was. He was so religious, so zealous. And he, and he, had, you know, he, he had the first five books of the Bible memorized. That's the only way you can get to his status. You have to have them memorized. So you have to be, have them quoted. And he, and he thought he was on God's team. He did. He, he, he thought he was playing for the winning team. He thought he was a superstar in God's kingdom. But he wasn't. He was blind. He was lost. How, think of the shock value of that. He was persecuting Jesus who was actually the Messiah that was promised. And Jesus had already come and done everything that the Old Testament had prophesied. Everything. And the Messiah that Saul had been waiting for put him down on that road suddenly and because Jesus had already come. And he was working against him until grace interrupted. Faith was given, right? Do you see that all through the Bible? God interrupts, they get saved. God intervenes, they get saved. He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But this is one of my favorite parts in all the Bible. Just two words next. It says this, and I just love this. It says, I am Jesus who you are persecuting, but rise. You've been this person. You've done these things. You've acted this way, but rise. That's just so awesome. Jot that down. But rise. And then say, everybody say it. But rise. That's what God tells us to do, but rise. And many of you, you know, we were this guy. We were this person. I mean, I was doing these things. I was this girl. I hated God. And God said, but rise. So there was a guy that I never really knew who he was. His name was Mel Trotter. Anybody ever heard the name Mel Trotter? Mel Trotter was an alcoholic um, that lived in Chicago. He, that's where he started out. He was not a good man. Mel Trotter was a binging alcoholic, violent, binging alcoholic. I mean, he, he loved his brew so much that he would sell anything. At one point, he sold his socks to get a bottle of beer. That's how bad he was. And he had a family. He, his wife was living in a lean-to. You know what a lean-to is? You lean to it so the front's open. Right? Wife and kids are living in a lean-to. They call it a hobbit. A hobbit in Chicago. And, and Mel Trotter, you know, he, 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 he was out on the streets all the time. Out on the streets all the time. And one day, he went on a 10-day alcoholic binge. Family never seen him. And he shows back up to the lean-to with his wife holding his dead two-year-old kid. No food, no water, no nothing. Dead. So Mel Trotter, if you're familiar with Chicago, that's right on Lake Michigan, was walking down to Lake Michigan, broken, distraught, coming off a 10-day binger, right? Broken, and he's going to kill himself. And, he, and he, he's walking down through there, and he hears something. And he, what he hears is what's called, I think it's called the Pacific Garden Mission. It's what it's called. And he went inside. He went inside and somebody was preaching the gospel. That's all they do in that place. They just, it's a mission and there's people in there constantly that come in and preach the gospel. That's all they do. And he heard the message and God gave him faith and Christ restored him. This was an awful man. He let his child die. God, rest, God restored his marriage. He restored his life. And this guy, this Mel Trotter, moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan. This is how I heard about him. And he established 67 missions with the same thing that he heard that night around Michigan, around Grand Rapids, Michigan, and all throughout the United States. They're called Pacific Garden. And specifically that means there's probably somebody preaching the gospel in there around the clock. And it's a really cool story. Look him up. 
but this man deserved this man deserved to go jump in Lake Michigan and die. That's how far he had gone. But nobody is too far from God. Look at your names again. Look at your names on your sheet. You're thinking, maybe God can't reach them. But we serve a big God. We serve a big God. We serve a big God. And we're small. Small me. Little me. Everyone needs to hear the message in their blindness. Everyone needs God to open their eyes. You need to be halted by the light, brought low, and then God will say, rise. But rise. No one in here under any circumstances is too lost for God to find them. Or outside of here, no one under any circumstance is too hard for God to break them. Write that down. Nobody's too hard for God to break them. God will break you. Verse 6. It says this. But rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are doing. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. And see, Acts 26 repeats this again. It says that the light of Christ was brighter than the sun. So they were speechless. They heard nothing. And and seeing no one, they rose from the ground like Christ had instructed them, right? And then verse verse 8, it says this. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. So he'd been right, standing up, and now he's kneeling, and now... He, you know, he was leading people, and now he's being led. And, and his spiritual blindness is what's causing all this. Now it's gone. But he's still blind. God, God humbled him. How many times have God humbled you? God has humbled me so many times. He was going to seize others, and now Christ seized him. He's going to break the genuineness of the godliness that we serve of others. And now he's the one that's been broken. And verse 9 says this, For three days he was without sight and neither ate or drank. So wow. So God takes away a person's blindness and he often does it with great humility. There's a lot of testimonies through humility, right? And we have people that, that we want to see saved. We have people, those names on your list that you have right now, all but... You know, all around us there are other people who God's saying they're ready now. We need to continue to think that some of the people around us, maybe we don't even know, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's somebody, a coworker, maybe it's somebody else, they're already on their knees. And God's just waiting for us to take that testimony to them and he'll say, But rise, and he'll give them faith. But we we don't do that. We back away from that, we cower away from that. God has prepared a heart with faith, and it's ripe for the gospel. Lift up your eyes. The fields are ripe. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, and it's so unbelievable how a guy who was taken down in a moment like this, it, doesn't it blow your mind that, 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 that what happened to Saul is what God decided that it's no more, and he took him down? That's what you need, right? That's what you need. You need to pray for people in your life. Look at your list and pray for them. God has to do that. God has to intercept. God, but we need to pray. We need to get low. We need to have God say, rise. We, God, God, you know, take him down. We need to pray that God will break them. It's the only way it's going to happen. God, don't let her sleep without knowing you. Don't let him go to bed without knowing you. Don't let him drive a car without knowing you. Please don't let him be in in that way. That's how it happens until it happens. They just got to fall in love with him. He has to show them that. Just love her, God. Be patient. Help me to be patient. Remember, they're blind. They're dead in their trespasses and sins. They have compassion, and, and, and we have to have compassion and patience to pray for them over and over and over that God will intercept because there's no one else that may be praying for that person. No one's too hard for God to intercept. And then finally this. Verse 
Some of you might be thinking that, and I get this, that person's just plain too evil. They are way just, they're just too evil. And maybe we think of that of ourselves. So write that down. God is, God is, no one is too evil for God to save them. Acts 10, 9, or 9, 10. There was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here am I, God. Great response, right? That's how I would want you to respond. That's how I would like to respond. Here am I, Lord. Here am I. That's a great response. Here am I. Here am I, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise. Go to the street called Straight. And by the way, the, 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 the big Roman highway around the area, in that area, was called Straight. He said, rise and go to that. And there's a church built on that, which we believe was Ananias' house, right there on the same site. It's in the modern city, modern city of Damascus. And he said, here am I, here am I, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And he's like, all right, I'll do this. I got this. You, you know, you picked the right guy, Lord. I, lo- I always wanted to go to that street. I always wanted to go to that street named Straight. I'm, I'm, my feet are moving. I'm going. I, thanks for the assignment. And at the house of Judas, oh, Judas, oh, he's a righteous dude. I like him. I like him. It's good. I'm going, I'm good. Judas is cool. I like to go to his house. I always wanted to go. And it says, look for a man from Tarsus. Oh, I've heard of Tarsus. That's good. That's good. Go to the house, holy, and look for a man from Tarsus. And look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. Ooh. And that's kind of crazy because we're on the same page, God. And I know you're sovereign and you know everything. And, and, and I know that you know it. Maybe, maybe you don't remember, but you know, I know you're sovereign. But in a small group, they were telling us the other day that this guy named Saul, big poster with his face on there, he's trying to kill me. Maybe you don't know. Um, maybe you forgot. You, I, know you, I don't know. He wants to torture and kill me and throw me in prison. At the house of Judas, look for a na- man named Saul. For behold, he is praying. Wow, he's praying. We know he prays, but you know what? And he's seen a vision. In a vision, a man named Ananias come and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priest to bind all them who call on your name. And the answer from God is awesome. It's awesome. He says this. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name. Do what? What? The kiss the Christian killer? The coat holder? The the cheer it on, go get him, guys. He's what? To think that God would take a person like that? Like him? Love him? You know what he's done, God? Where he's been? The things that he's done to you? But it's what God does. It's his thing, right? He takes the least of these. I was a sinner. I was a sinner saved by grace. And it was awesome. And I won't ever forget that, right? But Paul later says that some of you who were, who were these people who were apart from Christ chosen by Jesus for the glory of his name nothing we can do salvation by Christ alone so don't ever think better of yourself let me just say that because you were blind too you were blind he gave you sight you want applause you want a pat on the back you want because you did something you were blind he gave you sight Are you grateful for that? Are you proud? Are you puffed up? I don't want to think more of myself. I want to think more of him. And it's really hard to do. I get that. And we long to see that happen to others. I hope you do. And that's why this part blows my mind away. And it should blow yours away. Because what do you think of Saul at this point? He's an evil man. Evil man. What we know is God said he is my chosen instrument. So what I thought I'd do is I'm just going to make a little sign, and I don't have a little sign. 
I have a big sign. And it's kind of, uh, kind of interesting because sp- I'm not a good speller, so I may not spell this right. Kind of dangerous, I guess. It's a big sign. You see that? If you're a Christian, that's you. That's you. There is no limitation from our God. You are a chosen instrument of God. You are chosen. Every follower of Christ in here today. I mean, maybe you were a harlot at one time. I don't know. I don't care. Maybe maybe you were an addict like Mel Trotter. I don't know. I don't care. If you're a follower today, right, maybe you're a run-of-the-mill stupid kid like me, a teenager running from God like I did. I don't know. Maybe. Whatever it is, whatever you regret, I don't know. I don't know what it is. The Bible says that the blood of Jesus covers all sin. All sin. I don't know what you regret. Because it, it covers all sin, and if the God in his mercy reached down with the light that he gives you, took away your blindness, and caused you to know him, he gives you faith to believe, he raised you from the dead, no more shame, what are you? You are his chosen instrument. And there should be a sign above your head that you walk around and it says, I am a chosen instrument of God. Not deserving, walking humbly, because there's no limitation. None at all. Sorry, my arm's getting tired. <laughs> no one is beyond the, the reach of the gospel. And let that lesson be woven into our church, woven into your heart, woven into your lives as we walk through life. No one. We should rejoice in our salvation that God has given us. We should rejoice in the salvation that we've experienced. We should pray for those who are still in darkness and, and, and that their eyes will become unblinded. Our loved ones, our friends, our enemies. Because we are we are a chosen instrument of God. Eyes unblinded. I pray that we would talk to those people. Look at your list. Know there's only one who gives us life eternal. And that they, on that, those people on your list, that they would become a chosen instrument. Let's pray.